managed to become a judicial assistant uh, uh, in those days, it was called. I think those, those positions are still going. But it was on two big fraud cases, one called Brent Walker and one called the Maxwell case. will mean nothing to you, but I worked with two incredible um, judges, one called Je uh, Jeff Wynn and the other one called Nicholas Phillips, uh, who later became Lord Phillips, Lord Chief Justice, head of the Supreme Court, and there on, and I learned a lot from those uh, two wonderful judges. I managed to get pupillage. I was then rolling around the temple, as it were, doing uh, third sixes and squatting and all the rest of it, and then I managed to get a te uh, or chance of a final third six up north in Leeds, uh, and I practiced there for 17 years before coming back down to London uh, and practicing here. So it's, uh, and I'm now very fortunate to be at the 36 group. It's been quite a journey, and it continues to be quite a journey. Uh, and you will hear a lot from people saying, well, the criminal bar is on its knees, its funding's gone down, and that's absolutely right. And us at the Criminal Bar Association are doing all we can to make sure that all the the wonderful work that we do, all the sacrifices we make for the poor and the unfortunate and the vulnerable, and anybody who's in our criminal courts, where it be uh, complainants, witnesses, or uh, defendants, uh, they are treated with courtesy, respect, uh, and integrity. But we need to get paid fairly for it. Uh, and yes, it's, it's, it, is a, it is a difficult road. Uh, uh, money is not what it used to be. Uh, and starting out is very, very difficult. Uh, I, I remind myself that when I finished bar school, I think I was about £40,000 in debt, there or thereabouts. That, that number sticks in my head. And that was in 1992, or no, no, 1993. So as we say at North, that was a lot of brass even in those days. And some of you may have uh, the burden of debt uh, on uh, your shoulders. Um, my day-to-day -day practice, uh, what did I do yesterday? I was uh, finishing off prosecuting rape trial. My practice is mainly in the East Midlands. I live in with my family in Surrey at the moment. So that's a two and a half hour commute up to Leicester. I'm working uh, whilst I'm going up there. Did my closing speech. Uh, then the judge released me uh, so I could get to Derby where I was prosecuting a sentence in respect of the historical sexual offence that I've done the pre-charge advice on uh, in respect of a, it's a 20 year old allegation uh, where a 14 year old uh, boy had uh, allegedly raped a 10 year old boy. Uh, the uh, defendant pleaded guilty and I wanted to see that case through and that's why I was given leave to go from Leicester to Derby uh, in order I could see the complainant. He read his own victim impact statement out uh, to the court. It was a very moving and emotional time. The defence counsel did the mitigation for the uh, defendant who'd been sexually abused himself. It was a very emotional day for everybody. But I did my job. The complainant felt his life had been changed for the better as a result of what happened yesterday. Uh, and the defendant and the judge doing the best she could uh, get, gave the sentence uh, that uh, she did. All, all in open court, I uh, am telling no secrets. Uh, then I come back home with a two and a half hour commute, working on the way back as well. It's a full packed life. Uh, I've got into chambers this morning just uh, at half past nine. I'll have to work all day. All day tomorrow, I've got a case to start in Birmingham on Monday, and I'm advising on the case, another case, and that's why I'm working over the weekend. What a full and active life. Actually changing people's lives, being involved, being at the heart of some very important things. And as I say, uh, I do, most days, most days, despite all the difficulties, despite all the downers that um, people say, criminal bar, um, or career the criminal bar um, has. Uh, it's not. It's the most wonderful thing to do. Uh, I do pinch myself every morning. I do feel so very privileged and so very humbled uh, to be what I'm doing. I encourage each and every one of you to get involved. Uh, I, I was told 26, 27 years ago the bar has no future. Well, here I am. Uh, we're very much alive. Uh, and all of us here, and all of you, and 
we're up, passing on the torch to all of you. Uh, we need to keep the rule of law alive. We need to keep up the system of justice alive. Uh, we need to, whilst you're on your journey, and enjoy your journey. Uh, really, it's, uh, you'll have your ups and downs, you'll have the no's, you'll have the, the final interviews, you might get down to the last one or two. I've been there, we've all been there. It's all an experience, it's all something to get, get something from it on the way. But all I can say to you is that I encourage you, I ask you to fight, join the fight, this is Justice Week, join the fight for justice. Uh, we've got to save the rule of law, not only in this country, but around the world. We've got to safeguard our representation, that the poorest in society still can have the best that society can uh, offer them by way of advocacy. So, um, no matter what your background, no matter what your difficulties, no matter what your hurdles, you can get over them if you believe uh, and you work hard uh, and you enjoy the company of other people who are on that journey uh, with you. Uh, so, um, brave heart, be strong, uh, and enjoy the ride. Thank you so much. Uh, I've always, uh, when I was in Leeds, I just virtually defended, and they were all legal aid cases. Uh, now I mainly prosecute, uh, and of course that's paid by uh, the government as well. Uh, and can you make a, a reasonable living? Well, you've got to cut your cloth, haven't you? All right? Uh, I believe you can make some sort of living. It has to be better. Uh, and I've stood up at Bar Council time and time again, and I will continue to do it. Uh, I've just been re-elected, uh, and I'm, I'm very humbled by that. Uh, they have to realise that we, that the hours that we put in, what we sacrifice, is worth something. All right? Uh, and we, uh, it, it's got to change. We're not being greedy. We're not being fat cats. Absolutely not. And, and actually, the arguments I have... If you want a kid like me, coming from my background, in order to uh, be a member of the publicly funded bar, for God's sake, make sure the fees are, are fair. So when you've got your, your 70, your 80, your 90, 100,000 pounds worth of debt, when you start off, you've got a chance of making a reasonable living from the get-go. And that's about social mobility. And this government, that they can say whatever they like about it, they are failing in respect of uh, the publicly funded bar and giving us reasonable fees to make sure that anybody from every background can become uh, a member of the publicly funded bar. And they've got, to, they've, got to, they've got to grow up about that. It's not about greed, it's about being fair, it's about being reasonable. And the more diverse the, the bar, that <coughs> increases justice. That's my view. So this is what all of us here are, are fighting for. But you, by coming through that door, are part of that fight. It takes an email to an MP. That's what it takes. It takes you to get involved, to write a letter to the to the newspaper. I write tons, some of them get published, on this very subject. So we're all part of the same family, whether we like it or not now, by you coming through that door. Thank you. Any other questions for James? Yes. Well, the, the work-life balance is, is difficult, uh, as my wife and daughter are probably tell you. Uh, but they know that I am committed to what I do. And maybe I'm unusual, but I love, love it. I, I love the travel. And I, I, I make that, of course, one has to be careful, one has to make sure that you're in a, a seat on your own and all the rest of it. Uh, but I love travelling, I work whilst I travel. And if I'm not working whilst I'm travelling, I, I write things. Uh, so I write, a, I write a lot of, hopefully, inspirational things. I'm writing my letters to the, the various newspapers, I'm writing articles, I'm making the use of, on the whole, every minute of my of my day, so it's part of my working day. So yes, it, it is difficult, and of course, 
um, when you're at the bar, if you're in the bar in the, 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 the South East, you, you will be doing a lot of travelling. Uh, up north in Leeds, well, um, I live 20 minutes away from one quarter, <coughs> half, away, half an hour away from the other. Um, so the position is, is yeah, I've made that choice. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm not joking, I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm pinching myself talking to you now. I, I, be, I feel I've been very blessed. So, but it's, it's not for everyone. But you're hearing me, you're coming here, uh, and you're certainly at the 36 group, and you live in London, where you'd be expected to travel around a bit. But you're going in with your eyes open. Thank you. Well, we'll just take one more question. Uh, yes, from Uh, if you're from Leeds and you want to go to the bar at Leeds, that one of the first questions you'll be asked at the pupilage interview, uh, why have you chosen Leeds? Well, I think I know the answer, all right? Uh, because at the regional bar, like local people, that's, that's absolutely fine. Uh, it's, it's, it's what you want. Uh, it's what you're comfortable with. I had a, a wonderful time up north. It's a very, uh, it's a much closer community than it is um, in London because you're seeing the same judges every day, you're seeing the same council every day, and that can be a very good thing. Um, uh, at the moment, I'm on the, on the Midland circuit, and I'm, I'm at the courts at Leicester, at Derby, at Martin, at Wolverhampton, at Birmingham. Uh, so it's a, it's a little bit similar, but uh, I do go further afield, and I do go to work uh, uh, in the southeastern courts as well. Um, Certainly, uh, there's not so much travelling. <laughs> Absolutely. So, if it, wh wh which part of Leeds are you from? Um, okay. I've heard it spelled. No, very well. So, so if you if you're in the bar in Leeds, if you're in Park Square, okay. So you're in um, Bradford Court. You can get you can get a train straight from Huddersfield to Bradford. Or you can get a train straight to, to Leeds or even to Sheffield. So the quality of life in terms of travelling is a lot better, uh, and it's a it's a it's a real real close to family uh, here um, but but I'll just say one more thing about the family of the bar uh, it used to be and uh, we'll, we'll all remember won't we when uh, after you'd be in court you'd go back to chambers and you'd have a sounding board there with your colleagues and perhaps go for you know a cup of coffee or something stronger our community now because we are our, our digital and that's all our papers are, are online our family now is in the road room uh, and that's how it's got to evolve and move on. Uh, and can I say, uh, my experience is going into roving rooms uh, with the, the younger bar, go and ask anybody. We're there to help. We're there to help each other. I bounce things off people uh, all the time. So it's a real community, but our community has moved on and changed in that we're in the roving room. So um, it's been a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, I hope you found it of some use. Uh, I look forward to meeting you again in the future. Uh, would you please excuse me, because I've got to do this case. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, and I've got to prepare, so I've got to go back to Chambers. But uh, I wish you all the very best. Thank you, Chambers. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right, next up we have Joe Hardy. Okay. Um, I'm going to say sitting down if that's alright because I have been standing up um, at the CBA stall downstairs and if you haven't come to see us yet do pop down because we've got registration forms and some leaflets for you. I'm going to say sitting down because I've been standing up all day. Um, so I've been told I have to tell you about myself. Um, I'll do that quite quickly if I may because I'd like to hear a little bit about yourselves. Um, I am a specialist criminal practitioner. I practice from Red Lion Chambers, um, used to be known as 18 Red Lion Court, now Red Lion Chambers. Um, I prosecute and I defend. I have a heavy emphasis on my defence work and I have some split between legal aid work and privately funded work as the gentleman asked earlier. I tend to specialise in serious sexual offending but I also have a fairly broad general crime practice. Um, I was called to the bar in 2010 so I'm now eight years cool um, and I love it, I think it's the best job in the world and I think the fact you're in this room um, means that you might think it's the best job in the world, maybe some of you are convinced, maybe some of you aren't yet. Um, what I would like to ask you, um, this uh, session is entitled Life at the Criminal Bar, and I was thinking um, and speaking to some of you actually downstairs about 
some of the reservations people have about coming to the criminal bar. And I just wondered if we could just do a show of hands as to who in this room has been told by someone, anyone. It might be a teacher, it might be a parent, it might be a, another student who's destined for the city, um, or it might be someone on the internet who thinks they want to talk to you about your life and what you want to do. But any of those people, who has been told in this room by someone, don't go to the criminal bar? <laughs> so that's, that's a lot of people. I'd say that's 80% of the room have been told that. Now the good sign is that you're still here. You're still at the criminal bar talk, so I presume you haven't ruled it out. Um, but for me, it's my latest pet hate, because I think people that say that um, are often not at the criminal bar, or they're often not people who've tried to come to the criminal bar. And um, there, are, uh, there is a cautious approach needed if you're going to embark upon a career as a self-employed criminal barrister. You're not stupid, you're bright people, you know that. There's a risk. Um, because financially, if you want to be rich, go and work somewhere else. Go and work in the city. Um, but my message to you is that if you are bright, and if you are a good advocate, and if you are like me, I hope, a bit of gift of the gab, and you're able to talk to people and to other human beings. Um, and if you're happy having a comfortable lifestyle, um, working hard, earning fair money, um, and having, at the end of the day, the greatest job satisfaction, then this might be the job for you. Um, the two areas, I think, that the people that say, don't go to the criminal bar, I think the two pegs that they hang their hat on are firstly the money, and secondly the lifestyle. I can't think of another downside to this job. Genuinely, I can't think of another one. Um, dealing with them in turn very quickly, if I may, um, because if I was sitting where you're sitting, I'd be sitting there thinking, well, what about the money and what about the lifestyle? They'd be my two questions. Um, and I went to one of these with my mum when I was 19, and, and no one really answered it then. Um, pupillage awards are low. You will see training contract awards and pupillage awards for commercial chambers that are four times, five times what you might get in a criminal set. Um, that's not going to change overnight. Um, it will probably remain low. But you are receiving some of the best training in advocacy during that year. You'll be going to court every single day if you're doing a pure criminal pupillage. You won't be sitting in chambers looking at papers. You'll be sitting behind somebody in court um, every single day and getting the best grounding you can as an advocate, um, which is important. Chambers, um, I'll speak about my chambers for a moment, I can't speak for all chambers. Um, we have tried our best to put into place schemes to help people. Uh, for example, we offer an interest-free loan to purchase a laptop if anybody's struggling, having come straight from uni and everyone's laptop is knackered and full of papers, you need to get a new one. We offer an interest-free loan for that. We help with practitioners' texts. We have copies in chambers for our pupils to use, access to Westlaw. We don't charge our pupils rent um, when they start earning their own money. And if you get a tenancy out of your pupillage, which is the aim, I imagine, uh, we don't charge rent for the first six months. We let people bed in, earn their money, and get on their feet and get going. So we've looked at how we treat our pupils, and we've tried our very best to put in practical steps to really make life easier, because we've all been through the same process. Um, in terms of money thereafter, you, you live and you die by your own work. Um, and if you work hard, and you're talented, and you're good with people, and you build up a, a strong work base, you can make a fair living. Um, at the criminal bar, in my opinion. Um, it's not what it should be. You're not getting paid for what you're doing, and it's not equal to the effort and the passion that's required. Uh, but if you can stomach that early and think, I'm going to put in more than I'm going to get out, and that's just the job I've chosen, as soon as you get over that hurdle, actually, if you work hard, you can make a fair living. Um, we are taking action against fees, um, or we have taken action recently, it's currently suspended, um, query um, what will happen there, but, but the Criminal Bar Association, who we represent today, um, are a fierce um, organisation and they will fight um, when the fees change and when it is unfair uh, to protect both us, it's our job now, to protect you guys as you're coming through. So that's money. Um, it's not great, but don't let people tell you that, that it's zero, because it's not. Um, well-being. We have taken, again, great steps at the Criminal Bar, particularly the Criminal Bar Association with our wellbeing um, officer, to really work on practices, particularly um, for women or care givers at the bar, people who have children or other people that they care for. It can be quite antisocial. If you've got to commute for three hours a day, get to court, be there for eight hours a day, work through your lunch break, commute back, it's a nightmare. If you've got people that you care for, it can be very, very difficult. 
Um, we are working on listing practices to help with that um, and all sorts of initiatives in relation to wellbeing at the bar and support to do the best that we can. Uh, but those two things aside, if you can look at both of those things squarely in the eye, and I do that now before you spend any money on the bar professional training course or any time looking for pupillage, um, if you can look those two problems square in the eye and, and be satisfied with them, the benefits of the job far outweigh anything else. And I still think it's the best job in the world. Um, I'm very fortunate to do it. And I hope that all of you have great success. And um, if you do decide to take the journey into the Commonwealth Bar, thank you. Right. Any questions for Joe? Thank you. Um, in relation to the types of crimes that you're involved with, yeah. um, I'm quite interested in regulatory crime. Yeah. So what is the best way to get into or practice in regulatory crime? So things like um, pollution, um, white collar crime, fraud, mm. that type of thing. Um, if I were you, I would look very carefully at the chambers to which you apply. Um, criminal chambers are a wide church. Some places are traditional crime, punch-ups outside pubs, sexual offences, very pure <laughs> crime. Other places have regulatory groups. Um, Red Lion Chambers, for example, we have a specialist regulatory section of our chambers for people that do that sort of work. Our junior tenants have opportunities to go on to comment to some of the big solicitor firms that conduct regulatory matters to get a grounding, make some contacts, come back, and then they can establish a practice. So the answer to your question is have a real look and um, undertake some deep research into the types of chambers you're applying to because if you do want to have a niche practice or a side practice, um, you do need to look into it. It's no good you going somewhere and ending up conducting day-to-day, <coughs> back-to-back criminal jury trials if you actually want to be um, advising or appearing in some of the regulatory bodies and things like that. So research is the answer there. Thank you. Any other? Yes. Um, like you, I'm really interested in and Yeah. Yes, um, I am quite old-fashioned in that I think that um, if you do both, it brings certain skills to the, to the other side, if that makes sense. So when I defend, I actually sit down with the brief and think, if I was prosecuting this, which witness would I call first? Which point would I really make you know, the meat of my case? And then when I'm defending, I think, oh, I can neutralise that, deal with that, and it's quite a tactical decision. I think it helps me and my brain. But that might just be me. I might just be not very good at one side or the other and need a bit of help. Um, in relation to the split, some people have a 50-50 split, some people do one or the other and they're exceptional at, at both. It depends on you. So my advice to you is if you have an open mind about uh, a, a practice that prosecutes and defends, look at chambers that do both, because some chambers don't, some chambers predominantly defend, or some chambers predominantly prosecute. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got an open mind about both, get a pupillage where you're going to be exposed to both. Um, you will hopefully have a supervisor, certainly at Red Lion Chambers we make sure our pupils have one supervisor who predominantly prosecutes, one that predominantly defends. They can see both before they get on their feet. And our pupils prosecute in the magistrate's court to begin with, so low level shot liftings and people having a bit of a disagreement, parking spaces and things like that, and, and find their feet. Um, so if you're interested in it and you've got an open mind on a mixed practice, make sure you're at the chambers that will offer you that opportunity. Thank you. We'll take one more question before we go on to Prim. Yes. Hi, hi, yeah. Um, my journey is um, a change of career later in life. What's the advantages of... Um, I'm really interested in criminal bar. <coughs> that been, um, um, so what's the advantages of, of joining the criminal bar later in life? Advantages for you or for us? For me. Advantages yeah, for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't sure. know where you come from or what you've uh, done, but... Uh, limited company, women limited company. So. Um, I mean, I uh, was a traditional... If, you, if there is one anymore, um, came straight through university, straight to the bar. But from my friends who have had a second career, or even a third, fourth, fifth career, um, it, it is a job that offers us, as professionals, great flexibility in terms of managing your working day. You don't have a boss. Um, you've got your clerks, and they think, my clerks think they're my boss. Um, I think I'm their boss, so we all argue about that every day. But um, you don't actually have a line manager, you don't have meetings to go to, you don't have anybody looking over your shoulder. And if, if you look at a piece of work and you think, this needs to be done by 3 o'clock tomorrow, if you want to do it at midnight because you're, you're a night owl, great. If you've got children and you need to do it early in the morning, great. You have the flexibility. And I think that, that in, later in life, I mean, as I grow up, I certainly found the flexibility of this job to be one of um, the main attractions of being self-employed. In terms of what you can bring to the bar, huge amounts. Yeah. People who've come from a second career have built up demonstrable skills and experience um, 
and we consider that in the pupillage process. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, right, now we have Fran. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to start my talk by talking probably about how not to kind of start off on the wrong way to end up at the criminal bar. So I um, made applications of lots of pupillages to all these wonderful crime sets and human rights sets, and then I accidentally put one in that's actually a clinical negligence set. And um, of all the pupillage offers I got, it was actually the clinical negligence set. So I, I went and did a civil pupillage and got paid an extortionate amount of money knowing full well, A, I haven't got a clue how to write these particulars of claim, and B, I've got absolutely no interest whatsoever in practising in this area. So um, what's quite interesting about life at the criminal bar, I would say to you, be extremely flexible. The entire profession, how I would sum up my job, is um, partly I'm an academic, partly I'm a social worker, and then the other third of me, I'm an entrepreneur, is how I label it. So when I say entrepreneur, that's a very um, posh way of me itemising. I'm just hoping I'm under my overdraft limit most of the time. <laughs> that, that's how you operate and you run things. In terms of this profession, lots of people will put you off. But what you really need to develop starting from today onwards is an extremely thick skin. You will have plenty of doors shut in your face during this profession. Not out of rudeness but just simply that's what happens. If there are 300, 400 applications that come to your door and you have one pupillage to offer, then yes, sometimes, unfortunately, you will get a negative response. But either you could take that as meaning, oh, I'm not good enough, maybe I shouldn't be a criminal barrister, or you could use that to bolster and to persuade you just to become that little bit better when you do make another application. And the reason why I feel equipped to say that to you is because I do not know, frankly, how many tenancy interviews I had. One of the most memorable I had, which was for a chambers that ended up trying to headhunt me later on down the line, I sat there saying to them, do you know what, I really want to practice in immigration crime. I think there is a hybrid area that crosses over in terms of trafficking of individuals, in terms of what happens to refugees that are prosecuted for coming into the country without proper identity cards. And there were these QCs sat there in that interview that were like, how are you going to do that? How are you going to push forward on that? I had plenty of negative responses in terms of the area of practice I wished to do, in terms of my appearance. Individuals even would say to me, are you not interested in doing family law? Nice Asian girl like you. And that's only sort of going back 15, 14 years ago. So what I would say to you is every single time that door shuts in your face, just take that as a positive, as a push forward. And the reason why I feel able to say that is because now I'm a contributing author to the chapter in Blackstone's Immigration Offences. So what I'm saying to you is that you will get a lot of naysayers, a lot of people saying, you're not good enough. Why do you think this is an area of law? Start, instead of listening to negative matters like that, start operating like you are a business person. So, for example, if you are serious about wanting to do criminal law, think of yourselves as the consumer, the solicitor or the client. Why would they necessarily want to hire someone that's straight out of university? Lots of us did that. I did that. But please bear in mind, you can do lots of other things in advance. You can be a paralegal for six months up to a year. Learn your craft. You can start developing an academic interest. You can write articles. Please do not think, oh, I've got to be a silk and, you know, 50 years old to write an article on this area of law. Nonsense. Write a blog about the criminal legal aid cuts. Get involved with organisations like Young Legal Aid Lawyers. Start off getting to meet people in the industry. Because imagine, if you are starting out as a business person, setting up a business, you can't just come out of university, out of business school and say, right, here's this place, come to me and, I don't know, buy uh, Lamborghinis from my car shop. You've got to show the skill, the knowledge and the aptitude. And what I'm saying is there are a variety of ways of doing that. And when you come to those pupillage application forms, Use some, some aspects people think, 
oh, well, well, why, why is that relevant? Use it. Do sell yourself and do tailor make your pupillage applications. Don't just kind of cut and paste or do it last minute whatsoever. Take the opportunities that you have today to meet individuals on the various stands, to join the Criminal Bar Association, um, come along to some of the lectures. Don't think, oh, have I got to be practicing before I can start going? Because quite frankly, some of you are much better equipped than me to know about the latest updates on dangerousness. So all of those things combine everything that people say are your negative attributes and just combine them to push forward. But I would very much say, you know, I, I listened when people told me it would be difficult, but I probably didn't appreciate um, a just how how much inner strength you have to have to continue going, but how much rewards you get out of certain things. So, for example, travelling up to Liverpool to vacate someone's guilty plea was a um, a young person who was 17 years of age caught in a cannabis factory. Nobody told me, for example, there that for that young person I'd earn minus £50 that day. Or writing advices to the Court of Appeal to get convictions overturned um, for victims of modern slavery. So it, there are so many potential avenues in, in this area of work. And unlike your city solicitor friends that will burn out at 30, or be bored senseless with their work, I think you, you probably see from everyone speaking here today and on the stands, it is an absolutely brilliant profession and it is extremely diverse and it is getting more and more diverse. And what we do need is new entrants um, with the guts and also uh, with that positive energy to push forward. So certainly please do join the CBA, do find out more information and, and just go for it. Questions for Fran? Yes. Um, you mentioned knockbacks, like what's your yeah. tenancy? Yeah. What did you do in the meantime after completing pupillage to apply for tenancy and actually secure the place? Got you. So um, what, what I did, I, I went to a very nice chambers that was a treasury council set, so they, they did a lot of work for the government. And on sort of first week, I said, oh, I don't want to work for the government. And they sort of looked at me to say, well, what are you doing here? So I, I ended up leaving there and worked in an immigration and refugee charity for a couple of years. And then I did uh, one third sixth crime pupillage. And uh, then I moved on from there to do another third sixth crime pupillage, in effect squatting, until I'd essentially built up a practice. I built up that business and a strong following of solicitors. And I got tenancy at another chambers. So please don't think that, you know, if I don't get pupillage at this particular set, I will never make it. Or if I don't get tenancy in a year's time, that must mean that I'm rubbish. Absolute nonsense. It's like a business. Build up your following, do incredibly um, good work. Every single piece of work that comes out in your name, make sure it's the best. And then you will get repeat instructions. Thank you. Any more questions for our friend? Yes. You spoke a lot about emotional strength Yeah. Um, I think you've got to have a good sense of humour, a good support network, um, and you just, I think the more, this sounds awful to say, but the more rejections you get, you, you almost sort of become quite used to it, and you just think, oh, well, never mind. I, I will prove them wrong. And you've just got to, um, you know, say for example, human trafficking and modern slavery, people didn't really think it was much of an area, and you just have to prove them wrong, you know, step by step, and you eventually get there. Thank you. And one final question for Yes. Go, going to your point about modern slavery and yeah. human trafficking, um, how did you know in the past that that would become? future problem? How, how did you kind of get that instinct? Because obviously there's been the, the human trafficking, models of the Human Trafficking Act, yeah. that, that's relatively new law, yeah. but how did you kind of understand that that was a problem um, in the past? So th there, are, there are a couple of ways. Uh, one is from the magistrates court and watching the number of individuals, um, particularly drug couriers, uh, I'd represent uh, a, a woman that had 
encouraging um, so many drugs inside her stomach, and she'd receive a sentence, frankly, that was higher than some manslaughter tariffs, and I just thought this is ridiculous. And the other side was actually I was defending um, one large trafficking case where, because the legislation at that time did not have harbouring in, in part of the definition, it meant my client was acquitted. And um, obviously as a defence lawyer, that's brilliant, but as an academic, this is pointless to have legislation that does not protect. And so I started getting involved with organisations like Anti-Slavery International and working with them in terms of the criminal angles. So, you know, think slightly outside of just, okay, what's my pupillage, what's my tendency? Start thinking, what am I actually interested in? What do I want to change? What do I want to develop? And how do you go about that? How do you go about the support organisations that are present? So, what are the problems today? And how do I help solve them? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prem. Right, that uh, leaves me. And we have just over five minutes. So, I'm going to keep uh, my part of the, the speech short and probably mercifully for the rest of you. Because now you've heard quite a lot about what it's like to be at the criminal bar. So, all I'm going to do is just to give you an overview of what my working week was uh, in the last two weeks. So that will sort of give you an idea. Uh, I mainly prosecute, that's not because uh, I don't like offending, but over the past four years, and I've you know, quite long now called, uh, I decided to concentrate on prosecution so that I could get to know my instructor and solicitors and do interesting cases. So um, I went away to, to Italy to do a sporting competition, came back with a sprained ankle and was hobbling to court on the Monday to start a rape case. And I arrived in court and the first thing that happened was we went before one judge uh, who said, I'm sorry, if you can't finish this by Friday, uh, you've got to go to another court. So we were left without a court. We went to another judge's court and that judge is... Um, has a little bit of what we call judgeitis, and he likes to control his barristers, and he likes to control his court, and so he sort of looked down his spectacles at both of us and said, well, what is this case all about? Why are you here? And he had this look of complete, I really don't want you to be here. So we had to fight to keep the case in his court. He didn't give us a very good time. Um, he particularly, uh, didn't like the way that uh, the legal arguments were proceeding, there were too many of them, so he insisted on sitting late. Now the first thing that I tried to stand up to him was I said at 5 o'clock, and we've been sitting since 10 o'clock with only a half an hour lunch break, I said, Your Honour, uh, the bar sitting hours protocol, which was bar crafted by the Bar Council, says that we should have an hour for lunch and we shouldn't sit beyond 4.30. Well, he said, well, you should have done your job properly in the first place. And he addressed that to both of us. And both of us were doing our jobs properly. But the whole point is that you need to have a quality of life. And you can't have half an hour for lunch. And you can't rise at 5 o'clock and expect to be um, in good nick to do your legal arguments. So I held my ground. And thankfully, the next day, uh, because I know the leader of the Southeastern Circuit who had a word in his ear, we sat at 10 and we rose at 4.30. And, and so that then continued. Uh, my opponent then started mounting legal argument after legal argument. That was day two. The complainant came to the witness box um, from a remote location. She was cross-examined in a rape case, suggested to her that she was a prostitute. She had to deal with that. Um, eventually, uh, after about three or four days uh, of this, uh, the jury uh, convicted the defendant. And I was able to tell uh, the court and the jury, because I didn't apply to reduce his convictions earlier, that he had in fact been in trouble before and had been in trouble for violent offences. Um, and it was a particularly uh, satisfying case for me because it was, it was one where there was an uphill struggle we were thrown out of my first court, the second court, the judge didn't really want to know and was hostile to both myself and uh, my opponent. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, I can't tell you 
the, the sort of sense of satisfaction that you feel when you know that you've got a good result and the 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 text that I got from the um, SOIT officer, the Sexual Offences Investigation Team Officer, who particularly mentors uh, what is I can now call a victim because he confirmed that guilty and said he said to tell me that you were absolutely brilliant and she loves you to bits. She hasn't really met me, she's only spoken to me on the phone. But it's messages like this that you get, and it's not just from the prosecution side, the kind of messages you get from your lay client, a professional client, from a judge that says, you know, oh, just to let you know that it's a really good cross, cross-examination. Those are the kinds of things you don't get through working in, in the corporate field, uh, through earning lots of money and burning the can at both ends uh, because you have uh, some big corporate client in mind. And, and that's the sort of human element that we bring. And so I would say to you all, if you like that sort of buzz from having somebody that you've never met before, but somebody that you genuinely helped get the best result, thank you, then come to the criminal bar. We'd love to have you. So I'll take questions. I've only got two minutes before I think we're thrown out of the theatre. I hope not. <laughs> Any questions? Anyone want to ask anything? No, any questions for the rest of us? Um, well, I hope that you all uh, feel suitably inspired um, and also suitably warned about the financial pitfalls but the ultimate satisfaction that you get from Jack and the bar. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the stand. We'll all be there and we'll be doing another talk in the afternoon. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you.